Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, we are very excited. I'm uh, up here to do two main things. One, give you the, the safety uh, intro that goes along with all of our events here now at CSIS, and to introduce uh, uh, someone who I think most of you know. He hasn't been gone that long, uh, but the, my former co-director here at CSIS, Dave Pumphrey, who is a, a senior associate here now uh, when he's not on the beach uh, and still advises us you know, uh, from the beach, which we all deeply appreciate getting his emails from the beach. Uh, did I mention he lives on the beach? Um, we are really, really pleased to have all of you here today. If you, if in the event of an accident or an incident here and you need to evacuate, please uh, exit out the doors that you came through and off to the right. If you can't get out that direction, those big massive glass doors that you see over there, you can also go over to the left-hand side out uh, this direction and there will be some hallways that lead you to an alleyway. So anyway, don't expect any incidences. Um, we are really, really pleased to have Farad and Fasharaki here today and uh, even more pleased that he is probably the one person that could get Dave to come off the beach and come back and visit us. So I'm going to be quiet now and leave it to Dave to introduce Faradun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you for permitting me to, to come back uh, to uh, moderate this session. A um, little over a year ago when I uh, left here at CSIS, I think the last session I moderated was with uh, Faradun. And uh, I asked him if he'd be coming back, and he said, well, only if you'll come. So I, I had an obligation, so here I am. But it's a great pleasure to be able to moderate this session. Uh, I've known Faradun for probably too many years to talk about and watched as he has really expanded his scope and coverage and knowledge of energy markets. And I think he is um, one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent, right, preeminent? Uh, 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 thinkers on what is happening to uh, global energy markets. I think his bio has probably been distributed, so I won't go through all that. But I, I do think this is a really interesting point in time um, to have this discussion because a few years ago when uh, oil prices were high, gas prices were low, and everyone was looking at the potential of unending amounts of money to be made by U U.S. companies to export in the uh, um, uh, international marketplace, the LNG marketplace, and the only thing worried people was whether the cost of natural gas would go up in the U.S. because of increasing demand. And Faradun came in and made a very cogent point that, well, there's two sides to this equation. It has to be uh, competitive with prices that are set by oil markets in uh, the international marketplace, especially in Asia, because of the long-term contracts. And so I think we've now seen that side of the scissors coming down, if you will. Gas prices in the U.S. really haven't gone up uh, very much, have really stayed in a competitive range, but the markets have changed uh, fundamentally. And I think that's what I'm really looking forward to hearing his presentation uh, this morning on how he sees this evolving over time. So, Farinan, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Dave, for your introduction. Uh, I remember last time when I was here, I said after Dave leaves, uh, Frank is not going to let me into the building, but uh, Frank and Sarah have been very kind, uh, and we've been in discussion now for several months about uh, how to arrange the time to, to be here, so I'm happy to uh, come and see you today. Uh, uh, last time I was talking about the U.S. as an energy superpower, and now we're talking about uh, uh, the, the problems of being superpower is also sometimes gives you some irrational exuberance and whether the irrational exuberance is going to play a role or not. Um, I have a presentation that I'm not going to go through all of it. I will show you a few charts, but uh, I want to start by telling you something very simple, something that I'm sure you either know or you think you know. That is, what is the difference between oil and gas? Okay because people often extrapolate from one to the other. And oil and gas are not brother and sister. They are second cousins, far away from each other. The fact that they have carbon and hydrogen each does not mean that there's an affinity in the family. And especially in the global market. In the global market, oil and gas or oil and LNG are far away from each other, much more than uh, oil and uh, gas in the United States would be. Now, Three things I want to start about the big differences. One is that uh, oil is like dating, gas is like getting married. Uh, the reason for that is that in oil you can date and change your mind, in gas you cannot change your mind, especially if you're in LNG business. You have to have long-term contracts. You need to have a house, a car, mortgage, kids, 
TV, all these things are infrastructure. Infrastructure really what gets you. And the biggest component of the cost is infrastructure. If you think, for example, today, any LNG from US, let's say tomorrow LNG from US was reaching the Asian market, only one third of the price would be the price of gas. Two thirds of it would be infrastructure. So we need to keep in mind the role of infrastructure is very important and it requires long-term commitment. Long-term commitment also means that if you make a mistake, you're stuck with it. In the oil market, you make a mistake, you correct it. But in the LNG business, you better be sure before you enter the foray because you are stuck for so many years. A lot of people mistakenly think that the volumes which are exported from the United States is going to be sort of like you buy in Henry Hub every day, the prices go up. It's international market that you can just buy, sell on the spot. No. All the volumes from the U.S. are sold on the 20-year take-or-pay contracts, exactly the same way as all the oil index prices. This means, again, the level of commitment on the part of the buyer is very, very dramatic. Okay, so this is uh, the first difference. The second difference is that you produce the oil first. I mean, you sell the oil first, then you... You produce it first, and then you sell it later. When you produce the oil, you don't have to worry about how am I going to sell it. You throw it in the wind, and it'll go somewhere. Maybe the prices would be less than what you want, but disposal issue is not an issue. In the LNG side, you have to sell it first, and then produce it later. So I, we had a discussion, uh, Frank, you remember last year about the uh, you know, DOE permit and FERC permit, but one permit is always missing, and that's the Adam Smith permit. You need to have Adam Smith also giving you a permit. The fact that you have a government permit just means that you have a license to lose money if you want to, but it doesn't mean that you can make money. People say, but I am so honored that we have now filed our application for FERC, and I get these announcements, and it seems like people are very pleased, because once you go into the FERC application, it's going to cost you $100 million. It's a lot of money you spend. You go in there, and you obviously have come up with the money to be able to spend it. So you see it as a way of graduation into this. But it is not the story. The story of building a liquefaction plant is a $10 billion proposition. $100 million is a very small uh, minor payment and all that. So what is important is that if you have to uh, you get the license, you have to find a customer to buy the the buying side is very, very important. And I would like to talk about where the demand is uh, in a moment. But a lot of people, particularly in the United States, they think it's a supply issue. I've got my permits. I'll produce it so it must sell. That's not it. You have the permit and you have the permission to go and lose money. But you actually cannot get financing unless you know somebody in a private equity who can give you the money without... Uh, uh, making any strong uh, requirements of uh, your uh, rate of return, basically, you have to sell first. So every application that people have made for FERC basically has a big question mark in front of it. Can I sell it? I know I can produce it, but first, can I sell it? Because I need to sell first before I can get my financing. The third difference between oil and gas is that oil is truly global. And gas is regional. Uh, gas prices are different in different parts of the world. Not because of domestic regulation. Every country can regulate prices. I'm talking about regional prices. US prices always have to be cheaper than Europe and Asia. By definition, because there's more of it here and there's more trade. European prices ought to be cheaper than Asia, although today they are not. There is an oddity in the system that uh, the flows from Europe to Asia have ceased because the Asian prices, European prices are the same. But basically, the economic logic of it says that the European prices should be higher than the US and Asian prices should be higher than Europe by the cost of transportation at the very minimum. Okay? So these three things differentiate these markets, and a lot of the conclusions that one can make from being in the oil business doesn't always play in so far as the uh, LNG business is concerned. Now, this is, by the way, of uh, prelim. Uh, I guess that the, 
Uh, next issue that I want to talk to, to you is the issues of um, uh, supply and demand. And I have tons of charts. Uh, I'm not sure whether I want to show them all or not, but uh, well, let's start with a simple one. You know, um, who wants to export LNG? Who are new players? Not talking about old players, new players. U.S., East Africa, Canada, and Russia kind of is a small LNG player, but has great ambitions. So if you add the projects that people propose, you basically triple or quadruple the global trade. So it actually cannot happen because there are no buyers. But in the oil business, you don't have any picture like this. Nobody in the oil business can come in and tell you that I can produce and export double or triple the global trade. So I want to say this just by, by, by showing to you that the availability issues and potential surpluses in the LNG business is much, much bigger than the oil business. In the oil business, if you look at the global trade for oil being about 40, 45 million barrels per day, and the Saudis, as the most important player, they are about a bit under a quarter of the global trade. But the Saudis cannot come and say, well, I can double the global trade. I mean, nobody talks about that level. So they, 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 on the gas side, the LNG side, the picture is more dramatic and more prone. The potentials are much, much bigger. Again, you have to sell first, remember? You have to sell first before you can produce. So it doesn't mean that it will happen, but the shadow of it on the market still remains. Uh, the story about the U.S. is um, uh, pretty, I think, simple in a way that a lot of volume is under construction, a lot of volume is already sold. So in our book, uh, these volumes are sold and they're going to go forward and the first U.S. LNG is going to come in in December of this year from Sabine Pass. However, when you go look at the, the future, you will find a lot of people want to export. And credible people, you know, sort of their people, BG or future BG, maybe Shell from uh, uh, Lake Charles. Uh, the only project that for now we include in firm projects is the Golden Pass, which is the Exxon Mobil's project. It's not because it's uh, just Exxon Mobil, but uh, the decisions for this have already been made. And uh, once the giant make the decisions, they don't turn around. I mean, it takes very dramatic. The shifting around because economics is bad or because the prices are low doesn't really play as much of a role with the big giants than it does with the smaller players. So we see that going. And remembering that 70% of Golden Pass actually belongs to the Qatari government. 30% is Exxon Mobiles. The original plan for it was that this project is supposed to go to Europe and uh, replace the volumes that the Gataris are supplying in, uh, in the UK market, and then bring that volume to the Asian market. That is the original plan. Now, whether by the time they, this project comes on the stream, whether that plan would still be viable or not, uh, remains to be uh, seen. But besides that, uh, we, we factor these things as done deals. So these, these factors, we assume that this volume is going to happen, bring the U.S. to about 70, 75 million tons. Then, of course, you have quite ambitious new projects as far as Chenier uh, uh, is concerned, which can easily put the U.S. as number one in the world. That would be the train four and five of uh, Sabine Pass, uh, train three of Corpus Christi, plus the purchases from Parallax uh, in... Um, Louisiana, this is the old uh, Martin Houston's uh, outfit. You put that together, then uh, I think Chenier would be the largest exporter of LNG in the world, bigger than ExxonMobil, and uh, the U.S. will be number one, higher than Australia. Uh, for now, those projects uh, are uh, not final, but I think in the minds of the managers of Chenier, it's pretty firm. They want to go forward. So this is the story with the U.S., uh, but you go outside uh, in, in Canada, they have given um, 
Can Canadians are given licenses much easier than FERC and DOE. I mean, everybody has a license. And everybody runs around and says, I have a license. Uh, but the Canadian system is by nature much more difficult to do. Much more difficult. The project's majority of the gas is dry. It's far away. You have to have an upstream connection. In the US, you don't have to have an upstream connection. You just buy from uh, available supplies. Plus, you have the First Nation, which is uh, the, you know, the, the Indians in India. They say, well, who are these American Indians? I said, well, these American Indians are more difficult than you Indians in India. Because when it comes to negotiation, they are tougher. And it's not just the money. Sometimes you offer them whatever they want. They don't want it. They say a small salmon is more important than $15 billion of cash. And uh, so this is a fundamental issue. Uh, and the uh, only company which has tried this thing uh, in, in great detail is Petronas. And um, the interest in the Petronas has brought in partners. All the partners are government. Very important, not one private sector partner. You have uh, Indian Oil, you have JAPEX, you have uh, uh, Sinopec, and oh, Brunei government. So these take about 58% uh, of the project, and Petronas has 42%, but they're looking to sell some more. However, the decisions are made as quote unquote strategic decisions. So, you know, sort of the short-term economic issues, the way a private uh, company would look at it, uh, they have uh, a much uh, different approach. But that project, all the problems they've been facing, left, right, and center. And this, if this is the future, for like, somebody who really wants to do it, uh, I don't know who would be keen to go and uh, spend huge amounts of money in Canada. Uh, maybe at some point in time, things will, thinking will change. But at the moment, we don't see any projects coming out of Canada for a long, long time. Long, long time. Gas is there, and as the British say, in fullness of time, things will happen. But we are not in the fullness of time right now. Uh, East Africa, I think, uh, better economics, in my judgment, than uh, Canada. Uh, however, challenges are there. It is a complicated project. The intention is to go ahead between Anadarko and ENI both. Uh, the Anadarko uh, has a plan for an FID by the end of this year. I think it's going to be delayed for certain. But uh, at some point in time, I think Canada has a, uh, East, East Africa has a chance. Of course, then you have Tanzania also in there, which is a one step behind. Then you have all the Russian projects. Um, uh, Russian project, Yamal project, is a done deal. And uh, whether we agree with it or not, it's going forward. And uh, I think train three of Sakhalin 2 project also will go forward. I think this is also past the point of no return. But a lot of other projects, whether the Vostok or Sakhalin 1, all of them have to, to wait until the supply has been committed to somebody. So when looking at all these things, you say, okay, then uh, what are the order of things? Well, I would say, actually, the order of things don't matter. Who is the buyer? Okay, you have to have a buyer. Remember, in this, you have to sell first and then produce. But who is buying? Uh, the assumption that there's an unending demand in the market is not accurate. Uh, you can go to Europe and you can sell at the, whatever the price is, a liquid market. But you load in Europe, the prices will go lower. In the Asian market, still, they would give you long-term contracts. Uh, they don't like 20-year contracts anymore, but 10, 15 years may still do. The question really is that uh, what's happened to major markets? Japanese demand has certainly peaked. If the Japanese bring in nuclear as they expect, which is about 15 to 20%, I feel very confident that this will happen then I think we are already at the peak. And remember, as the nuclear comes in there, LNG doesn't go down too much, because what keeps the Japanese system going are the oil-fired power plants. Thank God for them. Without them, Japan would be in big, big trouble. Oil-fired power plants are the one which keeps the country going. And as 
nuclear comes in there, they go out first. There's some impact on LNG, but not dramatic. Uh, however, the chance of a substantial demand growth in Japan is not there. Uh, the Japanese government, as a matter of policy, looks at LNG as a medium load for the power plant, not base load. Base load is coal and nuclear. This is a stated policy at the highest level in METI. And renewables is going to be peak load, but medium load is LNG. So they are not willing, the system is not willing to depend too much on gas. And we're talking about uh, anywhere between 20, 25%, maybe 30% of the power sector coming from gas as compared to like 48% today. So actually percentage contribution goes down. Uh, at the conference that Guy San you uh, attended in Japan, uh, you had the uh, senior official from METI actually making a comment which made the utilities very unhappy because he talked about much lower percentage. He told the real story of the plan that people don't officially talk about is that a much lower role for gas. So we don't see the demand in Japan growing, but Japan has one weapon that nobody else has. Japanese contracts start coming up for renewal, starting from middle of 2000 or late 2018. First one is Abu Dhabi Gas Company, Ad Gas Export to Tokyo Electric, that will uh, come up for renewal and it will either become zero or only a portion of the total. Abu Dhabi, they're gonna be talking about LNG imports themselves, so why would they want to continue to export? My guess is that that contract probably will end up going to zero. Uh, so the next one after that is the big six million ton QG1 contract coming up from Guitar. Uh, I think six million tons, I don't think you will, they will renew all of it, renew a portion. Decisions are not made. And then many contracts come from Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, and then other suppliers. So the Japanese government, is not really involved in this decision. Decisions by the Japanese utilities, do they want to continue buying from the same players or do they want to go a new player? If everybody says, okay, let me get out of my deal with the Guitaris and I want to go and buy from Canada, they can make a project. Okay, so we're talking about 20 to 30 million tons of volume the Japanese will buy between 2019 and 24 as a supply replacement, not as a demand growth, okay? Supply replacement, and I will come back to say where the supply replacement may come from. Many projects are hoping that this supply replacement means that they can get the new projects going forward. I will argue that the Japanese buyers will buy most of the volume from the existing projects with unsold volumes, and there are a huge number in front of us. In Korea, there is already a, a fix in uh, with the energy mix. The LNG demand is on a permanent decline. And again, this is different. Several years ago, there was the assumption that gas demand in Korea will grow. No, it's pretty much stated. It's gonna be coal, it's coming back. You know, I think uh, somebody has to write a book, David, about the golden age of coal coming back. You know, we can talk about it as much as we want, but actually, the need and the consumption is rising, it's not declining. And uh, the Europeans can go their own way, and the independent Republic of California can go its own way, but the rest of the world would be looking at it a different way. Everybody understands that uh, there is a carbon issue, but the actions needed to reverse the coal's progress, not there. And we see, uh, one of the things that the Japanese are doing, which is quite remarkable, they're going to get the existing coal fire plants, pull them down and rebuild it. And rebuild it and they get 20%, 25% more efficiency. And because you do it on top of the same plant, you actually don't require all the environmental hustles that you would do if you do something brand new. They're gonna do some with the gas also the same, but rebuilding in the existing sites, these old fashioned plants where you can do combined cycle and get 55, 60% efficiency is really make a huge difference in the total volume. So in, in, uh, in Korea, I think you have a, a serious issue of declining demand, plus the game has changed. Korea gas as the largest importing entity in the world, 
until the formation of the new Japanese entity, JERA. They are also middlemen, they're not end users. They have to sell to somebody else and the end users prefer to buy from somebody else or they buy for themselves. So if you are SK Corporation, if you're GS, Caltex, if you are uh, um, Hyundai, if you are any player yourself, you want to supply yourself. So the Korean demand growth is not gonna come and the supply replacement is not gonna be like Japan because Korea entered the market about 10 years later. So the supply replacement volume will come in the 2020s, but not so dramatic as a case, the case of Japan. Taiwan, small growth, a couple of million tons here or there. Yes, by all means. Contracts are not coming up for renewal until late 2020s. And then, of course, the big giant case of uh, China, very dramatic issues in China. Uh, the state of the economy, the state of the energy demand, all these things are very controversial issues. We assume that the growth rate in China is about 4% GDP, that the numbers that you have about 7% are very unrealistic. But natural gas demand growth has been hit hardest than anything else because the Chinese government raised the gas prices just before the oil prices collapsed. So gas prices in China on average are $10.80 a million BTU. Just imagine four or five times higher than the prices in the US. And this is for any domestic or international imports. Uh, honestly, nobody in China knew at what level of price the demand stops growing. We always knew there was a place, but now we know. That is too high. At that level, the demand growth has already almost ceased. We have one or two percent growth in there. So all the Chinese buyers who have committed to buy LNG, they say, oh, actually, uh, sorry, I don't need it. I can't sell it. And if you don't like me, please take me to arbitration and see if we ever do a business with you again. And so you can't take China, you can't take India to arbitration. You go there, you do it at your peril. Because what you do is that you challenge not a company, but you challenge a whole government. And they take this very seriously. So all the people who have lost out as a result of non-performance or a beginning of non-performance, they have to just lump it and take it and uh, not advertise it. Uh, nobody is going to get into a, a sort of... Uh, a shouting match with one of these two countries. So then uh, in, in China, the demand growth has really slowed down and you have now the beginning of the companies coming in and say, I don't want to lift what I have signed. And uh, well, that's how it is. So in China, the problem is the price of gas is too high. If they reduce the price of gas, can they give an incentive to the demand growth? I think they can, but the whole system is growing much slower. It's not the way that we used to think that you give them the incentive, uh, we go forward. Um, I don't want to sort of uh, badmouth my competitors, but some of the forecasts you've seen about China, about the demand growth, it's just all one line going up. And so the LNG suppliers, oh, I love this because this is good news. Whatever I do, I can sell. That's not the case now. No, those curves have to be redone in a very, very dramatic fashion. You can't just sell anything you want into China. Plus that the Chinese have become now very good at bargaining. They are the toughest customer today in the LNG business than anybody else. The Japanese are actually very nice. <laughs> they buy the volume, they pay a bit more, and they don't renege on the agreements. You know? So if I'm a seller, best buyers. But you sell to China and India, you, know, you have uh, to take some additional risk in the system. So India is suffering a problem with the demand for LNG, which is totally reverse of China. The prices are too low. The Modi government very bravely removed the subsidies from oil, but took a totally reverse position on gas, fixing the prices at $5 a million BTU. So nobody wants to buy anything from outside because it's too expensive. And if you don't have the gas, you just shut down the power plant. That's pretty okay. In China, you can't shut down the power plant. They put you in jail. But in India, it's the world's biggest democracy. You don't want to produce it, you just shut it down. And you get away with it. So the issue is actually, both in China and India, if the government just let go of gas and make it look like oil, I think they would have a much better situation. But both of them insist. One is too high, one is too low. 
But both of them are very unrealistically separate uh, from the uh, real market and real world. Uh, then uh, you, you end up with a bunch of new players. Uh, new players are much more interesting. Indonesia emerging as a, not a supplier, but also a big importer. Thailand as a substantial importer. Kuwait, Dubai, potentially Abu Dhabi very soon. These are the countries which actually much easier to sell to them. They're less fussy. The volumes are not so big, but combined is pretty okay. I mean, all of them combined probably be the same size as Korea as the second largest LNG importer. So this is on the, on the, on the demand side, I want to say that the real increase in the volume is going to come from replacement of the existing supplies. That is in Japan. For the other countries, any demand growth will have to come in from market reform, which frankly, I don't see it happening in the near term. But uh, these are countries where uh, in China, decisions can be made quickly if they decide to cut it. I've never seen the Chinese cut anything down, always good at increasing the prices. But uh, who knows, maybe at some point in time, they decide to do it. Uh, there is also a, an interesting angle here that you need to keep in mind. You know, the, the Chinese company has been very powerful, going around the world, buying all the assets. Where did the money come from? Did you think about it? How did they get all the money to go and buy all these assets from where? Actually, they're pretty simple. The government had rules that you produce the oil and you sell it at the international market price and the difference you can keep. As long as you have a source for it identified. So the Chinese companies, they have the highest average cost of production of oil in the world. Certainly for conventional, but even compared to unconventional, they'd be pretty high. $50 a barrel average with some of the recent uh, production is about $65, $70 a barrel. It was fun to say that $100 and keep the difference and go uh, buy assets in Canada, Mozambique, uh, all over the world. But now you produce at 50 and you sell at 45, it's not fun because the government has not changed the rules. So all this money in the hands of this giant corporation is going to dry up very soon. But there is a silver lining. The gas prices have been increased. So if your government reduces the gas price, a lot of these companies' revenues will be obliterated. So they bring pressure on the government. Don't reduce the gas price. Keep it up because that's the only way I can make enough money. If you make me lose all my revenue, I have to come to you and ask you for a budget to run the company because I don't have enough. One and a half million people work in uh, CNPC and one and a quarter million people work in um, Sinopec. The oil industry itself has four, five, more than the population of Singapore just working in those companies. So you don't let me make my own money. I have to come to you for a budget because I'm not only doing the work for a, the oil and gas business, I'm also providing social welfare. So these are, the gas prices get tied in into this decision in a very dramatic fashion. So we, we look at the system and say, okay, the, the, the demand side has limitations, it can change, but in the next 10 years, if I'm a seller, I should be looking really at the Japanese contract replacement. And in Japan, a new giant has been made, a company called Jera which is the combination of Tokyo Electric and Chubu. And they are now going to be 40 million by ton per annum plus combined buyer. And half of their volume comes for renewal. So they can be kingmakers. They can decide what to do. And I'll come in a moment to their options. But so on the, on the supply side, maybe uh, Dave, I'll jump a lot of these things, because I talk about each of the countries one by one, but I show uh, one chart here for you. Okay, this is a chart of an old man LNG being under three chains or pulling on the head, okay? Number one chain is, we all know that the US volumes have been sold, but to whom? The US volumes have been sold to middlemen, not end user. Now, I'm not sharing with you exact number, but I'm telling you, it is within the range of 25 to 35 million tons. 
remains unsold to the end user. Okay, this is a pretty dramatic number. So these guys have to find a market first. So if you sell to GDF or GNF or BP, they bought it, but they're not gonna use it themselves, they're gonna go sell it to somebody else. And they haven't sold it to somebody else. Why are they not selling it so quickly? Because today, hub index prices from the US are more expensive than oil indexation. There is a price of about $70 a barrel as a dividing line. Whenever the price of oil is less than $70, oil indexation is cheaper. Assuming hub doesn't go up. Uh, we assume that no, forward care for Henry Hub is forever at the less than $3.50. So assume that's true. Uh, we can debate that, but let's assume that's true. $70 is the dividing line. If hub goes to $4.50, then $75 can become dividing line. But the question really is that you can't bring anything into Asia and land it at less than $10 a million BTU. Cannot be done. And if you buy oil indexation, you're paying less. And you buy a spot market today, is $6.50. So in that environment, if I haven't sold it already, I have a tough time selling it right now. So the smart guys are the ones which sold all of it. And collecting a small rate of return in between, 20, 30, 50 cents a million BTU from uh, uh, the volume in their hands, and they, are, they have a utility rate of return, but they are smiling. Those who haven't sold, they are still seeking, and a lot of them. Uh, I am uh, astonished how many people have not sold, because they thought that maybe hub prices go up a little bit. Nobody saw the oil prices coming so dramatically, and they are now stuck with the volume. And some companies like uh, Gas Authority of India, Gale, is now stuck with six million tons volume. One million ton they've sold to Shell, but Shell bought it, and Shell is also a middleman. They're gonna have somebody else. So it hasn't solved the problem. It's off their books, but it's somebody else's books. But uh, they have tough time selling in India because of the pricing that I mentioned to you earlier. So this is from the existing firm sales and purchase contracts about half of it remains unsold to the end user. Then we go to an, another portion. We look at the uh, Gatari volumes. Gatari volumes are easily 25 to 35 million ton from the 77 million ton is quote unquote flexible volume. That means it hasn't been sold in long-term contracts. Some of it going to Europe, but waiting for a big buyer in the East. And what the Gataris did basically is that they played hard to get. <laughs> and uh, I think the hand has been overplayed. But they created the Australian market and they created the US market. They should have sold ahead of these guys. If they did it, Australia and US could have been 10 years delayed. But they didn't. So now they have these volumes at hand. However, they are the most competitive LNG producer in the world. In a $30, $25 oil market, they can compete and beat everybody and still make money. So you have another volume in their hands. The third, which is very new, is a non-performance of the long-term contracts. So people are not lifting the volumes that they're supposed to. And of course, you, you agree, you sign that you have to do it, but most of the ones which are not doing it are the Chinese, and Indian companies. I uh, can't tell you who they are, but uh, you may know some of them. They are not lifting the volume. So if about eight to, 17, eight to 15 million tons of the volume is not being lifted today from the existing firm contracts. Now, you add these things together, you have an incredible story. You have about 70 million tons of LNG, which by itself could be the largest exporter of LNG in the world from the existing project which has not been sold. So the question which comes to mind is this. If you are a JR or you're a buyer in Japan, would you like to buy from a new project or would you like from a project which has already spent the money and the LNG is gonna be delivered and they can't sell it? So these decisions have not been made, but uh, I can tell you that most of the people would prefer to buy from the existing volume rather than a project. Somebody wants to do a project in the US, a greenfields project. So would I wait for them or would I just go and buy it from 
Toshiba, for example. Toshiba is a very important company, but they have 2.4 million tons from train three of Freeport. All and ready to be sold. So if I'm Jera, will I buy from them or will I buy from a project in Canada, a project in the US? So I think that uh, you can come up with, with reasonable conclusions that the existing volume needs to be clearing first before the new volumes come into the market. So you have this poor guy now, the back is broken, uh, waiting for FIDs, and everybody says, Let's be, let me go forward. I'm going to do FID, I'm going to do FID. But uh, um, it is remarkable. Today, we have 10 projects in the US pending FERC approval. 10 projects. Okay, It's amazing. 10 projects would triple the US volume. So uh, somebody here is smoking something. <laughs> Where does it go? I mean, who, who is going to buy it? And each of these guys, when they go and file the request for FERC, and FERC is not going to make a judgment on whether it's a good project or bad project. They just do environmentally sound or not. So with the exception of one project, we believe they will approve everything. And it costs you 80 to $100 million each. So you spend your money, you get the permit. <laughs> And then um, you assume that somehow you have this market that things can go into it. But you forget this big picture here. 70 million tons are still sitting from the existing projects where firm sales and purchase agreements are signed and firm take or pay contracts are signed. So this, if you want to clear this one, it'll take time. So again, in fullness of time, yes, uh, highly unlikely that it's easy to justify things in the near term. When I go outside the US, and remember that if so much of it depends on your perspective of the price of oil, and you know, sort of, since uh, only God maybe knows what the price of oil will be, uh, if you think that the price of oil will go above seven seventy-five dollars then okay, then the US projects could be competitive. If you think for a five, 10 year period, the price is gonna remain below that level, then any new project coming from the US would deem to, to be above the oil index prices and nobody who is uh, in any private or public company would be brave enough to come in and sign a long-term commitment with you. So they may say, I'll buy it for three years, four years, but then you can't get financing for it because the banks, demand to see your purchase prices for a long period of time. So it is a really big issue. And I think the irrational exuberance in the US is much, much bigger because uh, the system, the lots of players which believe there is an unending volume is a supply side issue. I unending demand, I'll just go in there and the Chinese and Indian Japanese will all buy it. You can see that um, uh, the big boys, you know, I mean, you, you know, if you shoot Chevron, they would never do this kind of projects. They know that internationally, uh, I mean, Chevron basically uh, wants to stay out of the U.S. LNG market, and I think uh, BP is a buyer. Shell may end up doing it because they're buying a BG, but they're actually not their own project. They're buying from somebody else. And Exxon Mobil, 70% Gataris, they have other considerations, but. Basically, international players, um, they don't see this as a money-making activity, but uh, it's something that maybe in the system they ought to have some share in. A lot of people who are doing it, they don't really know what happens in the international market. They are uh, eager because they don't know the realities on the buying side. And this desire to go forward, you know, 10 projects filed, is one billion dollars of cash you're paying only for engineering studies. I mean, it's a lot of money. A lot of these projects, there is no terminal, there is, there's a piece of land, but you're already coming with $100 million to pass on to FERC. And FERC is going to be really busy. They're going to keep all these projects going. But uh, at the end, you have to see where are... Is it possible that all these projects come? It's impossible. Impossible. Look at the supply demand. The U.S. then would be exporting 150 million, 180 million tons. Impossible. There is nobody in the world ever who can make that happen. Maybe the Almighty, but maybe he can't do it either. The numbers are just too big. Now, in Canada, uh, 
The circumstances are in such a way that things would have to be much, much slower. Because you have to have the upstream, you have to have the First Nation approval, all these things will block. In the US, you don't have to have the upstream. The project system is streamlined. You go to FERC, they give you the permit, it's up to you. You can go and lose money. As Dave mentioned, you know, only two years ago, everybody was saying, well, you know, we, we're going to be short of gas in the US. And at that time, many people did say, you let the market limit it. And the market has limited it already. Exactly what logic should have prevailed at that time. Don't worry about everybody taking the US volume. The market takes care of it. So you have this uh, supply demand issue, which are becoming very serious. A lot of new investments are coming in and are planned. And maybe, Dave, in a year or two, maybe by end of 16, middle of 17, the system will clear. The system will clear after a bunch of people lose a bunch of money and find out maybe, um, well, I lost it once on the regas terminals. Now I lose it on the other side. But actually, you're not going to build it because you can't get the money to build it. But you, you end up um, being very disappointed, and you end up selling it to somebody else. And somebody will sit on it, and um, 10 years from now, they'll bring it. Basically, demand growth and supply replacement will provide a need for these things, but not in the next 10 years. There would be a demand generated and volumes in needed, a lot of it, late next decade or early decade after. But in the order that people are hoping, unfortunately, they would have to reconsider. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so let's open it up for questions. Uh, if I recall correctly, there are a few rules of the road here at the CSI. I kind of forget them over time, but um, if you could identify, well, hold your hand up for one thing, but if you could identify yourself and your affiliation and also to the best, uh, to the greatest degree possible, form it in the form of a question. So if it's a comment, at least put a little bit of lift on the end of the, the, the statement. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, touch on the other supply source you didn't mention, um, which, you know, with the uh, uh, agreement now with Iran uh, moving forward, a lot of speculation about what could happen with the massive reserves of gas there. And I know you have a lot of insight on Iran. I was just wondering if you would like to um, provide us with some of those insights, or do we have to buy them? Oh, well, I'll give you a, a sort of a, a little bit of insight, but the bill shall follow later on. Uh, I think the, there is a full realization in Iran that the LNG market is too late. It's too late. Uh, all the projects which got stuck by sanctions and were not executed, I think they are not coming back. There are um, three LNG options in Iran. One is that there is a project called Iran LNG, which has started a long time ago, and during the Ahmadinejad period, which almost brought the country to, to ruins. Uh, so many bad decisions were made, and one bad decision was to start building all the associated facilities for this Iran LNG project. So they spent three billion bucks. They have uh, built a receiving terminal, utility system. Basically, they've got everything except the liquefaction plant. Uh, it's like, you know, sort of you want to re create a new uh, life, but you forgot about the heart. <laughs> so, of course, sanctions need to be removed, and liquefaction needs to be brought in. But too much money has been spent. The governments, when they spend a lot of money, nobody's going to walk away, even if it's better to walk away. So I think the, the existing plan, the plan is that you bring a liquefaction and complete it. That's about eight, nine million ton project which in theory could be available 2022, 2023. And of course, because they spend most of the money, they're not gonna worry, well, is this gonna be, have a, give me a good rate of return or not? They just need to do something with the asset which has already been, um, uh, money which has been already wasted. This is number one. Number two option is to take Iranian gas to Oman. And Omanis are running out of gas, so they have a whole train empty not doing anything. So 300 BCA, 
million cubic feet a day, two million ton project in Oman would be waiting. And the Iranians have to negotiate a throughput fee, and then they supply some volume to the Omani uh, government for domestic needs, make a deal in that one. I am positive that deal will be made. It is uh, definitely the intention on both sides is to execute it. So two million tons can come out from the, probably be marketed by the Omanis or the Iranians in a joint venture, or um, the Iranians may want to be in front in the marketing so they say that I have some LNG business. The third option, which is a bit more remote, is uh, five million tons of uh, LNG capacity in the Das Island in Abu Dhabi. You know, the Iranians have a very interesting situation with Abu Dhabi. I mean, this is, a, you know, one of those things which are no-brainers. It's so obvious, but nobody's doing it. There are two fields in Abu Dhabi and Iran, neighbors. Iranian field is called the Salman field, and the Abu Dhabi field is called Abu Bakush field. These fields are less than one kilometer apart. The Abu Dhabi one is getting depleted. The Iranian one is not touched. Here is a no-brainer, you just connect them together and uh, no infrastructure needs. You just need to make a deal. And I think deals like this will happen. No matter what happens between the tensions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, these, these deals will happen. It's just so overwhelming, the economics in that. But as part of that deal, I mentioned to you earlier that Abu Dhabi is gonna stop exporting LNG to Japan, but maybe then they would make that available to the Iranians, that you can have this facility, which is at least part of it. One train of it is fully functional for another 20 years to make LNG and export, or we do it together, or we do something that becomes into a form of LNG. So LNG may come, but inside of Iran, only existing project in Oman and Abu Dhabi maybe as a joint marketing, but that's the story. The rest of it, Iran is going to be exporting by pipeline to neighboring countries. And, and I know in, in, in Washington, everybody thinks geopolitics first and economics second. There will be no gas from Iran going to Europe. Okay? No matter how many political scientists and journalists and the president and senators say it, it makes no sense. And what makes no sense, politicians cannot make it work. So it won't happen. It will only go to neighboring countries. Doug Hengel with the German Marshall Fund. Very nice to see you both again. Um, you didn't uh, talk about Europe or Latin America as sources for LNG imports. Well, the reason is uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, the price of gas stinks. It's too low. The demand for gas is falling. Of course, supplies in the uh, North Sea area are declining too. Uh, so maybe LNG volumes uh, will begin to go up. However, remember, any time Uncle Putin can increase the volumes of supply and kill everything. I mean, you know, honestly, I don't know why the Russians built a pipeline to Europe. It's like a noose around their neck. But the money is gone. So the money is gone, and the utilization rates are significantly lower, and new pipelines uh, avoiding Ukraine are also been laid, so I don't see it as a viable market. In Europe, you can buy volumes on a short-term basis, but the long-term commitment in this market, nobody can make. Pace of demand is disappearing, and you have the big bear, which can any time just switch things on and off and make it very impossible for you to survive. Latin America is different because the, today, the highest price LNG is paid by Mexico, Argentina and Brazil. I mean, it's remarkable, but all of them are sitting on huge amounts of gas. It's just that they haven't been able to get their act together. So nobody would sign long-term contracts. So if you want to have two-year, three-year, five-year contracts, maybe, and today it's easier to sell to Mexico than it is to sell to, to Japan or Korea. Much less a problem, and you get better price. But as a long-term source of... Uh, demand, I don't see them. I see that this is, not only they won't import it, but they may be exporting. And remember, you know, it is a matter of time before um, Venezuela enters the market and takes the natural gas to Trinidad and start exporting from Trinidad. Uh, the logic of it is overwhelming, 
the governments have stopped it, uh, I think this will come. So that area, I don't see it as a big buyer. Uh, Charles Ebinger, Brookings. Good to see you, Faraday. Thank you. Um, wonder what your views are on where is the market for East Mediterranean gas, particularly with the recent announcement of a huge find off Egypt and, of course, also the Israeli gas. Where is this all going to go? Well, <laughs> probably nowhere. Uh, uh, <laughs> the issue is that, you know, Egypt now has turned to an importer of LNG. They have one FSRU, they're ordering a second one, and the third one is being negotiated. So certainly the Egyptians will not be buying anything, but uh, these projects, the way it's executed and looking at uh, the, the operator, I see is a decade development. So. I still actually see that Egypt becomes a more than, Egypt and Jordan, both of them bigger and bigger LNG importers via sort of um, floating uh, receiving facilities. Uh, if the resource is as big as it is, and you know, we, these claims come and go, uh, nobody knows something is so big by making one discovery. After five years, you will prove it. But it does make a difference. I think the impact of it is gonna be more in the region by itself. As time goes by, more and more, we see that the, the potentials of export from Israel is becoming less and less. Uh, I think, I don't see really, uh, if it's a giant field, of course it can go outside, but history shows that the big giants don't get discovered um, more than once every 20, 30 years. Maybe it's one of them. But I, think, I, I see that most of it is gonna be regional and uh, distributed around the countries, you know, sort of, Israelis may export to Egypt and Egypt may export back to Israel. Uh, Jordan in between may not have to import um, uh, LNG from outside. I, I, I have not entered it into any calculation. But if it comes, it'd be one additional burden on top. So I have to put one extra chain on top of this poor guy who's carrying the additional weight. Thanks. Uh, great presentation. Bill Eichord, uh, consultant. Uh, could you say a few more words about the Australia projects and how they relate, the existing Australia projects, and how they relate to the chains up here? Well, they relate to the Australia projects are pretty much all sold. I would say five to seven million tons are unsold from the existing contracts. Uh, pretty much everybody had expected $90, $95 oil. Remember, uh, unfortunately, all these projects were commissioned at a time when the price of oil was high. And everybody assumed that it's forever. So let's go ahead and make decisions. Uh, many of these projects have a stress test of $65, $70. Now, the decline in Australian dollar making things a bit cheaper. Maybe some can go at $60 with no rate of return. I know people claim that even at 40 or 50, I can make money, but uh, I don't see how. So the reality is that it doesn't matter. These projects are coming. Cash flow will come in, and all the shareholders, which are very upset about the rate of return, as soon as they see the money, they forget. So the actual IRR may be negative for many years to come, but Australia situation, the implication of everything I say is for new projects and expansion. New projects and expansion are not likely to come. One of the cleverest and the luckiest people in Australia is the, the project by uh, uh, Shell Arrow. Uh, Shell studies everything to death, so they took so long to study it, they missed making a big mistake, as everybody else. And so uh, there is value, this, you know, Long-term studies and the difficulty in making decisions has some value. So that gas now can be sold. Remember, in Australia, when people start their projects, $3 a million BTU. Today, you're lucky if you can get it at $8. So your assets have tripled without doing anything because everybody, and people still haven't taken the gas out. Once the gas begins to go out by the end of this, this year and it starts next year, it may hit nine or $10. A million BTU. So domestic prices would be higher than the end price that you will sell in the LNG market. But 
Everything is coming, you know, usual delays, but uh, it's going to be in the market, and um, shareholders will gradually forget, and they hope that one day the price of oil will go up and rescue everything, and it might. Hi, Michael Ratner with Congressional Research Service. Uh, in your chart that's up, uh, conveniently still up there, do you think that gas will flow eventually or will the projects just not sell that gas and it'll stay in the ground? And also, there is, uh, in your presentation, I'd be interested in, uh, there were no comments about uh, potential environmental regulations driving greater natural gas demand around the world, particularly in China. Well, there is a specific question, a broad question. Uh, you know, those people who produce gas, they love themselves because they say, well, I'm environmentally better than everybody else. But when I talk to environmentalists, they hate them just as much. They hate the gas people the same as coal people and oil people. Only the gas people think they are better. But the other people who look at them, they say it's the same, you're the same, you're just a less fossil fuel polluter. So, uh, how much of a difference actually it makes worldwide? I think some difference. Some difference places like, you know, like China, it could grow, but the Chinese government uh, raised the prices in a way that stopped the gas demand growth. So, these things are not really dependent on the en environmental, environmental acceptability. Only people who make the arguments themselves are the guys who produce it themselves. But the, I think it's better. People like it, diversification policy, it sort of provides different options for people. Uh, it would make some difference as a matter of economic policy. But I don't think the environmental angle is going to make a huge difference. It's always in the presentations, but not actually on the ground. Uh, in so far as the, I'm sorry, the existing projects you asked? How much of that gas will actually Oh, okay. I think that uh, these projects are all sold and the buyers are credible people. So I don't think, well, I can think of one who may renege, but uh, I think pretty much people will buy. But the options are clear. You don't want the gas, you pay for the liquefaction price and leave the gas in the ground. Uh, at this point in time, everybody, everybody plans to lift and then they would sell it maybe at a discount in the market because you lose $3.50 or $3 a million BTU is a lot of money. It's equivalent to $20 a barrel oil that you lose. Uh, you might be able to get away with a discount on the market today. Uh, down the road, I don't know. I think the majority of the volume, vast majority will be lifted. But there is a, you know, if the, if the things go really, really bad, the price of oil goes even lower and the market becomes very bad, then of course, your maximum loss is your liquefaction fee that you would pay. Uh, we are assuming all of it will go out. Just to extend that a second, on the liquefaction fee, what do you estimate that generally to be? Well, if you want to do a, a, a brownfield project, it's 3350. If you want to do greenfields, it's four to five. If you want to do it in Canada, maybe five to six. So basically, you're looking at Paying the fee at three to three fifty, or perhaps losing three fifty if you sell the gas. So there's, yes. there's a point in there where you may make a decision. Yes. Which way to go? This, exactly. You're, so you, you look at if if your three three fifty is what you're going to lose, then why you want to lift it and be involved in the whole infrastructure? But I don't see anybody among the buyers of the U.S. gas who can justify to the governments or shareholders that let me not lift it. They rather buy it and kind of lose it in the system somehow because. It is just such a great uh, embarrassment. Uh, I don't think anybody will take it. I think we have a question here and then... Don't forget your... Um, oh. Yes. Jane has been... Uh, see, Dave is a tunnel vision person. Thank you. Uh, Evan, <laughs> Evan Fury from Statoil. In the context of all you've been saying, if you look at Tanzania, and bear in mind the recent updated legislation that they've passed, which is outlawed, uh, a floating LNG option. Uh, what are your reflections on where that is going to fit into the cycle that you're describing? Well, the cycle, you know, I'll, I'll put the East Africa together. I think uh, in, in, in Tanzania, you have big boys playing, and uh, so they know 
their path around already. In uh, Mozambique, you have now Anadarko as a new player, which is at one of the best marketing teams around, and they are very active. And ENI is a little bit of a slower player at this stage. However, I think that both of them are about the same position. In, uh, in Tanzania, you have a well-developed um, regulatory system, but a leftist government. In uh, Mozambique, you have uh, not a well-developed regulatory system, but much more business-friendly. So which one is faster, better? I think uh, probably Mozambique will go first, but they are about the same level. One place that I didn't discuss, for example, I think that uh, Papua New Guinea uh, would have a better cost basis than East Africa. East Africa would have better cost basis than Canada or Russian projects. Uh, so they are in reasonable shape, but first, please find me the buyer. After you find the buyer, then we see who, which one is more clever in terms of costs. But until you find me the buyer, I don't know whether it makes a difference, even if you offer it for free. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation, as always, Faradun. Uh, I do have uh, questions, I guess, a pair of questions regarding the Panama Canal. Uh, what's your assessment on the expansion project, uh, the timeline, and to the extent, um, I mean, so, and then the second question is, uh, how much impact would that expansion have on the competitiveness of U.S. LNG exports, but especially from the timing, uh, the sequencing and, uh, and uh, timing uh, perspectives, please? Thank you. Well, you know, timing of it, whatever the Panama Canal Authority says, I mean, what do we know? Uh, they say, I'm coming in this time, and then they say, no, I'm not, I'm coming later. But, you know, the project is done, so whether they come in in early 16, late 16, early 17, I can't tell, but it's coming. Uh, but I'll, I think we need to think about it in two ways. One is that, you know, you go on a small road that's been expanded into a highway, and you pay the toll booth, you pay more to go in. Uh, you get there faster, but I don't think it's cheaper. So the, the issues of Panama Canal expansion is gonna make it cheaper, it's not possible at all. I mean, if I am Panama Canal Authority, I will exactly calculate your saving and charge you for it. Because otherwise, I'm a bad economist. Okay? I, I end up with the alternatives and charge you. So it doesn't save anything, it speeds up the process, but the way Panama Canal works is a very complicated way. As you have to go in there, the water has to be emptied, then you go in, the water fills, you have a limited passage volume. And you are competing with all the cargo ships. ships. You know, we work in another area which is not LNG, but LPG, which is a much more dynamic market today from the US as LPG is like LNG fast forwarded. Okay, so the US now suddenly number one LPG exporter in the world, but low oil prices, arbitrage door is closed, storage is everywhere. I mean, it's a sort of a mess. But LPG guys all want to go through the same canal. All the cargo people want to go the same canal. So uh, those 10 guys at FERC, which by the application, they think that these ships are gonna fly over the Panama Canal. You have to go in there, book many years in advance. Uh, exact timing, if you miss it by one day, you've lost your slot. It's not an open highway that you can go wherever you want. Now, what is the cost? We estimate the cost to $2.70 a million BTU for delivery into Japan. Uh, there is another way of calculating it. We actually have a, a model which tells us what the alternative is. You don't have to go through Panama Canal. You can go through different routes. The smaller ships and longer it takes. But there's only money. And when you want to do it together, it costs you $2.70 more. So you do the calculation, you find out that they cannot charge you more than your savings. Maybe five cents, 10 cents, but they can charge you whatever they want. So the range maybe end up to be $2.85 or $2.65, I don't know. But I think $2.70 is the right number. And if you go to South Asia, it becomes a lot more expensive. If you wanna to go to East Asia, you have to look at the distances. The same way as if you export from Canada, it's going to Japan is good, but going to India is not good. It'll be a long way. So uh, I think the, the, the issue which is misunderstood is that everybody thinks it's a general four-lane highway and whatever ships want to go through it can go through. 
This is not the case. You have to schedule it in there, and there is a limitation to volume. Just as a, a personal insight, I'm now living close to a city that has much of its economy driven by activity at its port, and they're counting on the Panama Canal to really yeah. grow their business. Of and, course. And it's not LNG tankers. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's right. So there's a question back here. You have one there. And then we'll get two, two more in the back. Why don't we get all the questions on the, the table now? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up really quick on the China question. I was wondering, uh, you said those regulations. Hello, Drew Case and uh, Jack Ferguson Associates. Um, how much uh, potential demand is being lost in China and India uh, from those governments locking the prices in res too, too high and too low, respectively? Well, it's an impossible question to answer. Fair yeah. enough. Potential demand is something we didn't exist, which might exist if all the regulations are in the right place. I don't know, but you can see the growth in demand has slowed down so significantly, so something has been lost. And uh, it was always clear that at the, there, there are different demand levels at different price levels. But we didn't know where the bottleneck is. Now we know. This price is too high, guaranteed. Now, if you reduce it by $2, will you get the demand going fast? I'm guessing yes. If you drop it by $4, before it was about $7 average, and it seemed to be growing by 6 7%, 8%. Now, suddenly 2% or less, there is a message in this. But in these countries, the, the data analysis, you know, you, you, you can play uh, econometrics as long as you want, but a lot of these data don't have a proper history. So you need to do it by trial and error. So yes, directionally, I think they've lost some, and they can reverse it. And will they adjust to these higher prices? I think many years before they adjust. So why don't we get the, why don't you get the two questions there in the back and that may be about all the time we'll have. But, but we'll this see. in the front has been asking okay, longer. Okay, three questions. Excellent presentation, Feridun. Herman Franz and EIG. I have two quick questions. One is, what will this avalanche of LNG do? I'm sorry? What will this avalanche of LNG do to global oil markets over the next, say, five, six, seven, eight years? And the second one is, do you see the emergence of pipelines from Iran to several countries of the GCC other than Oman? I think uh, the avalanche of LNG will uh, only can do any, any damage to the oil market as far as the power sector, industrial sector is concerned, and gradually they are shifting out of that. So it makes an imp impact on fuel oil demand, but I don't see it making a substantial impact. The ideas of putting gas into transportation, uh, which was, uh, I don't know, you know, it's not that long ago, the natural gas highway, you know, it's like only two years ago, but we forgot about it already. Uh, what happens is that the price of oil goes down, changes the thing. So the problem is that the world is a much better place at $100 oil. Everything works very well. You don't have to be clever to make money. <laughs> Everybody can make money. So. Between $100 and $70 or $60 is a huge difference. And so I don't see at the moment the growth of natural gas transportation to be a big issue, although eventually it might become as time goes by. But so I, I, I don't see this avalanche making that much of an impact on transportation. It's only on the power generation. And uh, in the US, the story is done outside of uh, the 50th state, we don't use any oil in the power generation anymore. Uh, but um, the rest of the world gradually moves out of uh, oil and uses more gas. I mean, so the, it does make an impact. But in terms of the sales from Iran, I think the Omani deal is a sort of a love fest between Iran and Oman. They would do it. Uh, the prices were not going to stop them. They want to do it because of the close relationship that they have maintained. Uh, when I was a young man uh, living in Iran, uh, I lived uh, nearby an air station. Air, Iranian Air Force every morning at 6 a.m. Uh, would fly and bomb the Dofar Rebellion in uh, Oman every single day. And the missions would go in from 6 a.m. and continue to 4 p.m. every day. They obliterated the enemies of the Omani government, Omani uh, kingdom. So the love is there. 
And now this love has been transferred to the Islamic Republic and it still is there. So this relationship will continue. But the logic of selling to Abu Dhabi is the most compelling logic because it saves infrastructure. My guess is that Abu Dhabi and Kuwait and later on when things cool down with the Saudis, Bahrain, I think four or five BCF a day of Iranian gas will go to neighboring countries and Iran would have a fully integrated system with the neighbors. As soon as the Iranians do it, then I think the Qataris would uh, reconsider some of the pricing options in the neighboring countries. So I think we've got... Uh... Let's go here because it's, her hand has been up, up uh, much, much earlier than everybody else. You're the boss. No, 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 because I'm going to forget the answer. Okay. I'm getting old, you know. Yeah. Yes, Julia Nane, Energy Ventures, LLC. I just had a quick question then. If the Chinese market is so uncertain, what do you think about um, the new pipeline from Russia and the Central Asian supplies into China? Will there be a problem with that? Well, uh, the, the Central Asian pipelines, uh, the issue, I think, such a deep um, commitment by China, and uh, the prices actually are not very high. Uh, I can't tell you the exact numbers, I know what they are, but they are competitive even at today's market. The Russian deal is not terribly competitive, but the volume is huge. Uh, it is equivalent to 28 million tons of LNG for 30 years with 100% uh, take or pay. From a Chinese point of view, I think it's not a great deal. Because I, I had a presentation to a series of uh, top Chinese officials, and I used this example. I said, buying pipeline gas is very much like going to an uh, all-you-can-eat restaurant. Whatever you eat, you still have to pay. And you have to go every day and eat from the same food all the time. LNG is like buying Chinese meal, a little portion here, then I don't like it, I divert it to Dave, and Dave divert it to Frank. You can get contracts where you can keep yourself out of this long-term commitment. So it, in a country like China, where you have, you're in the brink of development of your own shale gas, for 30 years making this commitment doesn't make sense. They said, well, that's true, however, uh, the president who is visiting here, uh, Mr. Putin, made the deal, and we have to execute it, so that's it. Uh, that that uh, slope of that contract is not very favorable. So even at $50 oil, it's pretty expensive. Will the Chinese come and renege on it? I don't think they will, because these are fundamental political decisions which are made by the state, not by the buyers. Now, please remember that in, in, in all the Chinese state thinking is that I would like to have the majority of my imports by pipeline from steady sources. A steady sources means Central Asia, Russia, and some from Burma. These pipelines bring it, and then the difference I would bring as LNG. It's not the reverse. It's not that the LNG is the core and the pipelines are fillers. LNG is the fillers. That's the way the state is thinking. So in that environment, I think they would cut the LNG imports and continue to take the pipelines. I think it's against the, their national interests, but I think the thinking is already set in stone, and that's what they will do. So in the back, I think there were two hands remaining, so if you can ask your questions quickly, and then we'll be able to wrap up. So Sarah, I think you. Sarah Vakshuri from SVB Energy International. Thanks a lot, Freedom, for a very interesting presentation. I have a question. Do you think that Iran could do the same type of arrangement, maybe not for LNG export, but export of natural gas to, let's say, Saudi Arabia from Farzad B uh, share? Because Saudi Arabia needs a lot of gas, we all, all know, and they obviously do not like to see Iran is extracting They're and selling them. They rather sand. Yes, gas from their own share field. So do you think that the same type of arrangement could be done with, like, let's say, Saudi or Iran? Well, you know, sort of, never say never in this business, but uh, I just can't see uh, this happening within um, the remainder of my uh, uh, lifetime, maybe the remainder of your lifetime. Uh, there was a, 
interesting story a, a while ago when Shell made a substantial discovery in the empty quarter. And uh, empty quarter is closer to Oman than to Saudi Arabia. So they say, well, why don't I take this gas to the empty trains of uh, Oman, uh, where Sh Shell has a big, um, huge presence, and make it into LNG and bring it to Saudi Arabia. And that would be cheaper than actually trying to produce it and pipe it to Saudi Arabia. And they said, for me to depend on some other country? Are you mad? Uh, remember, of course, the Saudis and Saudi oil establishment, they see themselves uh, superior to everybody else. So they, the idea of, you depend on my oil is okay, but I don't want to depend on you supplying me with natural gas. So that, I think, is a, a basic way of thinking, which is not going to allow it to happen. But there is something else. The crude burning in Saudi Arabia, I mean, if I were them, i just burn the crude. Okay? Because this crude, I'm never going to produce. It is not that this, I'm losing the crude because I'm not selling it outside, I'm losing the value. This is a dead crude. I built the capacity, I want to show off to everybody else that I can do this, but burning the crude is an easy way, and the crude costs you about 50 cents a million BTU, basically, uh, if you take the cost of production of the crude. So you can't beat that by producing any gas. Meanwhile, the Saudis have put a lot of money, actually the gas production has risen quite substantially in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think a lot more than people imagine uh, but they, they, they're increasing and they, they're investing more. So they're going to try to produce as much gas as possible. The idea of even LNG imports would be much easier for them to swallow than the gas from Iran. Uh, because LNG you can buy from everywhere else. They, only, they don't want to buy it from two countries. They don't want to buy it from the Iranians or the Qataris. But everybody else is okay. So uh, Russia, Australia, sort of um, Canada would be fine. Uh, for now, I think the policy is to burn crude and try to produce more gas internally. So yes, it makes sense, but many things which make sense don't happen. So I think one last question, uh, if you still had a, a question there, in the, the lady in the, the back. No? Okay. I thought there were, well, anyway, so I think we're done. Thank so, you very much.